You're listening to Bob Harden, streaming live online at bobharden.com. Thanks so much for joining us here on the show. It's brought to you in part by Florida Weekly, your complimentary copy available at hundreds of locations throughout the Paradise Coast, as well as the Greater Naples Chamber of Commerce. We have with us Dr. Zudi Jasser. He's the president and founder of the American Islamic Forum for Democracy and author of a terrific book, which I just completed, A Battle for the Soul of Islam, an American Muslim's Patriot's Fight to Save His Faith. Doctor, welcome to the show. Oh, it's great to be with you again, Bob. Thanks for having me back. Well, thank you so much, Doctor. And I, I'd just like to acknowledge you for, I think, writing, a tr- first of all, a very personal message and sharing your personal life, uh, but also sharing your thoughts about what's happening in your faith. Uh, why do you call it a battle for the soul of Islam? Well, I think, you know, as in every reform that has happened in history, it starts with ourselves, and I think within uh, our faith community, yes, there's some larger organizations and movements that we need to fight, but ultimately the battle is within, and uh, does is, is Islam the faith about freedom, about liberty, about giving people the right to choose to reject or accept Islam, or is it about autocracy and theocracy? And the reason I, I had such a personal element to the book was You know, if you look at statistics, over 50%, 54% of Americans have never met a Muslim. And uh, I felt like it was important for them to understand what my personal family values were, how, you know, why I'm a conservative and and where I got those values from. And then ultimately, some of the struggles I had within my own family, uh, I think that if you look at political Islam, its fuel, its energy comes from its tribalism, its sense that the collective good of the global Muslim community is more important than individual rights, etc. And I think ultimately some of the same conflicts I've seen in local communities uh, uh, socially, uh, that uh, right after 9-11, for example, there's a chapter in there about tribalism and how even though most Muslims that I knew uh, were obviously against terrorism and the ideologies that fed it, they didn't want to be self-critical, they didn't want to be open publicly in America about the sources of that and and the uh, global entities that were uh, wielding power in American circles uh, that they agreed with me but didn't want to say it publicly. And then I had the same struggles, uh, you know, working with my father, who I had the greatest respect for, uh, but ultimately within our own families, this tribal unit can sometimes be very suffocating. Yeah. Well, I genuinely appreciated your sharing the information. Of course, uh, you're a descendant uh, of uh, Syrian immigrants, and uh, your daughter, a do- a father, a medical doctor, you yourself, uh, I think it was a lieutenant commander in the Navy as a, uh, uh, as a physician, also serving in Congress as a physician, uh, f- as the cr- congressional physician. So, I mean, you are loyal to uh, the United States Constitution. You're also loyal, and, and you shared so deeply your faith and, and, and its impact on your life. Uh, uh, N- uh, Nadal Hassan. Uh, had a very similar background to your to you, and he's the guy who perpetrated the terror in Fort Hood. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I think, you know, in that comparison is basically this battle. You have one individual who, who came here, his family was from uh, um, Gaza or the West Bank and, and uh, was born here, uh, decided to join the military. I don't think he joined it for... Um, reasons of nationalism or freedom, but really joined it uh, to get his medical education and was growing up in a family where uh, he probably heard that America was uh, anti-Islam, anti-Muslim, was fed Zionist conspiracies and all of these uh, propagandist uh, um, uh, stories that the uh, Palestinians and others feed Muslims. And ultimately then when he served, uh, he was at ground zero in this conflict, which is he was uh, working with troops that were going out to serve in Afghanistan and Iraq, and now we see him in this trial basically saying that he had to serve the greater jihad, the Islam, uh, the movement of Islam, and, and uh, become part of this uh, movement to protect the Taliban and, and all of this, uh, what I call Islamo-patriotism. And the opposite is my family who came here and taught me the narrative that I could be more Muslim in America than anywhere else in the world, that this country gave me, through the separation of mosque and state or church and state, the ability to accept or reject any tenet of my faith, and that that was ultimately the Islam that we knew. My family rejected 
uh, all these conspiracy theories and said that the main cancers in the Middle East are Saudi Arabia and Iran and the theocratic movements and taught me that Israel was the only democracy. So a lot of these narratives uh, are really what feed uh, either counter or anti-radicalization, as in my case, versus radicalization, as in Nadal Hassan's case. Right, so in a sense, uh, Islamism or uh, is more of a political movement than a religion. It's a, it teaches supremacy. It teaches the, if anything, at best, tolerance uh, for other religions, as opposed to understanding and accepting pluralism, uh, that people worship God and uh, experience their, their faith in a different way, uh, which was what you embrace. So what they, what they embrace, so you're saying, is that, uh, well, we'll tolerate these people if we have to, but ultimately... We want a uh, world caliphate, and we want to uh, have domination over the world. Exactly, and at the core is this mixture of a theology and a political movement, or a theopolitical movement, that creates, it, it takes somebody's personal religion and, and, and mixes it with patriotism, and that's why it, it can be very powerful to young uh, uh, Muslim teens, as we saw with the Boston Bombers, uh, or with uh, Faisal Shahzad. Faisal Shahzad, the Times Square bomber in the court, basically said, and I talk about this in the book, where he said he had to serve the jihad. And, you know, this Islamo patriotism to where uh, he uh, looks upon his American identity as one that was in conflict with his faith and his uh, uh, religion, thus um, becomes a manifestation of deep conflict. And that's why. At the core, you know, I have a, a story in there, as you may remember, where I was in uniform at the Islamic Society of North America, went to present a medical paper with the Islamic Medical Association with my chairman of the medical department at Bethesda Naval, and there I went to listen to the keynote address given by Siraj Wahaj, the imam that was the first one to do a prayer at Congress, and this guy holds up the Quran and said it is an obligation for Muslims to ultimately change these mad uh put to God made documents into the place of man-made documents like the U.S. Constitution. And I went to the mic and said, you know, this is sedition. I, I want nothing to do with this organization, and you should all be ashamed of yourselves, and any federal or, or federal employees or, or U.S. military should leave immediately. And I was just horrified that I had been there, and that was in 1995, at, at really the largest Muslim Brotherhood legacy group in America. And that really set the tone for me on what these groups do and what they stand for. You know, I have so many questions and so many thoughts that I want to share with you, Doctor, and I just genuinely appreciate your taking your time. I'd like to share with you, it was so impactful, not only to for, for me to, to share your personal experience as a Muslim, but also in the last chapter, you share some of the verses that you believe fuel uh, uh, Islamist uh, behavior and thinking and so forth. And as you point out, uh, there is no intermediary in the Islamic religion or, or in the Muslim religion that uh, the, the Quran is written in Arabic, Arabic and uh, each person is responsible for developing their own experience and faith through the Quran. And you should point out how their interpretations differ so much from the interpretations you learn from your family. And this is really the crux where you know, ultimately, the reform that's necessary is, you know, for, for those that are obviously, you know, most people are, are who are non-Muslim, uh, I'm not, we're not, I'm not saying as a Muslim that they need to really subscribe to any uh, agreement with the scripture, but uh, I think if we can find Muslims that can interpret the Arabic in a way that's commensurate or consistent with America's formula for pluralism and freedom, then I think that's all we need. And if you look at some of the verses, uh, for example, the, the ninth chapter or the fifth chapter, the ninth one that talks about the chapter of the sword, uh, and, and that one really uh, says that if, you know, uh, uh, kill the infidels where you find them. Now, now that verse does say that, but I talk about how it's set, it's set in one battle in which uh, the uh, treaty had been violated, and since it was one of the last revealed verses, it wasn't a verse that applied to all non-believers into infinity. It was just that one time in 617 A.D. in which God allowed Muslims to defend themselves and, and fight that battle. And ultimately, just like uh, our generals in Afghanistan would may say, kill the Taliban or kill al-Qaeda where you find them, uh, all, all 
religions that believe in just war would believe that. Yeah. Or another verse that says, you know, do not take Jews as, or Christians as friends. The word in Arabic, awliya, is not friends, it's legal sponsors, as any religion would want its own faith to be its own legal sponsors, as we see in Jewish law or in uh, uh, Christian uh, law with, uh, you know, if you have a godparent to your children, you'd want them to also be uh, Christian. So that's not, you know, an anti, anti-Christian anti or anti-Jewish uh, passage if it's interpreted in a moderate way. You know, uh, we, there are two battles going on. One is the battle within uh, your faith, and uh, as you explain, it, it's an internal battle that needs to uh, have dialogue among in the uh, Muslim community. But there's also a battle with uh, Islamic terrorism and uh, Sharia law right here in the United States. In other words, uh, we citizens who perhaps aren't Muslim, we, we should have our own concerns about what's happening. Oh, absolutely. Sharia or Islamic law is the instrument by which Islamists uh, wield control. So in America, where Muslims are barely 1% of the population, they're obviously not going to take over America. But what they want to do is ask for special privileges, ask for uh, ability to segregate or separate their populations out from the American legal system, which becomes incubators for radicalization. Yeah. And I talk in the book about an example where a Muslim teacher, 28 years old, asked for special dispensation in December of uh, 2008 to be allowed to uh, take uh, three weeks off to do her pilgrimage. And it's interesting that uh, the left wasn't upset about this because she uh, uh, wanted to violate union contracts, and uh, the defense, they refused to let her do that. Ultimately, Eric Holder, Department of Justice, stepped in in 2011 and say that she should be given those three weeks off because of religious freedom. And I say, listen, you know, I, I'm still 45. I haven't, sir, I haven't gone to do my Hajj pilgrimage yet. And you should do that when you're able to. And moderate Muslims will allow themselves time and not force this thing upon their work. She had been a teacher for one year. And this is part of their imposition of Sharia, seeing that that demands that uh, the Illinois school system uh, Chicago school system and impose and give her freedom. And what if every teacher said they had some religious requirement to take three weeks off during finals? Yeah. And uh, they don't care. They just want to be given special privileges, which carves them out and allows them to radicalize and, and create their own Islamist movement within this society. All right. Uh, again, Dr. Zudi Jasser, his book, uh, a Battle for the Soul of Islam, an American Muslim's Patriot's Fight to Save His Faith. A Battle for the Soul of Islam. I highly recommend it. encourage you to get a copy and read it. Also, check out the, the website for the uh, American Is Islamic Forum for Democracy. It's AIFdemocracy.org. AIFdemocracy.org. Doctor, wish I had more time with you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Anytime. Thanks for having me, Bob. My pleasure, indeed.